Hi, everybody. It's good to be back at Rust Berlin. It's been a while. I used to co-host this meetup, and so it's nice to be back. I think this is only my third meetup after the pandemic, so it's, uh, I used to go to a lot of these and have not in the past couple of years, so it's nice to, to be back again. Yeah, so I guess we've already done the introduction. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, WebAssembly and the web. And just to kind of get a gauge of who's in the room here, I'm, I'm wondering, like, how many people here are interested in the topic of Kubernetes as orchestration platform? Okay, seeing half-ish. And how many people here are interested in WebAssembly as a compiler target? Seeing a bit more. Okay, so that's interesting. I might take that into account and uh, tip uh, a little bit more towards WebAssembly in general, but we'll also talk a little bit about that on Kubernetes. So with all of that, first of all, why is this relevant? Why is WebAssembly relevant? If you don't uh, care about Kubernetes at all, why should you listen to this talk in the very first place? Well, everything that we talk about today starts with Rust code. So we're going to be talking about running Rust code for like in the cloud, whatever you want to call the cloud. That might be a server, that might be a Raspberry Pi, it might be your, I don't know, your refrigerator running something, could be that. It's totally up to you. Um, this is just running Rust code somewhere. So with that in mind, we're going to start with a kind of a refresher about WebAssembly, what WebAssembly is. And for our purposes, what we're going to be talking about is we start here with code. That's probably Rust code if we're at a Rust meetup. We're going to compile that code. And instead of compiling it for x86 or for ARM architecture, we're going to compile it to WebAssembly. And WebAssembly is sort of like a web native binary format for machine code. And the cool thing about WebAssembly is that it can run anywhere that you have a WebAssembly runtime. So that includes browsers, obviously, but it also includes other places like running on the edge, running on some kind of machine that you have somewhere. Um, and of course, that might even be IoT machines like refrigerators. So why should you care about WebAssembly? Well, the, the big thing and the reason that it was started uh, for the web or for the browser is that it's very portable. So you, you can compile your code once and then run it sort of anywhere. So if you've heard that you know, back in the 90s with Java, this is sort of an actually a, a slightly better attempt at that. Um, I won't say any more about that. Uh, but, so uh, we're talking about pretty small package sizes here. So if you're writing something in Rust and you compile it for release mode and you strip debug information from it, you usually end up with a few kilobytes of actual code. Um, if you're writing it in other languages, you might end up with a little bit more. But the biggest thing I've seen, I think, is a C-sharp app, and it's like a few megabytes. So these are really not big binaries. It's completely sandbox. We, after all, this was started to run in the browser. So you really have a kind of very, very tightly controlled security story in the browser. Um, and all of that is taken onto the server with it as well. And you have really great startup times. So the, the cool thing about WebAssembly is, and we'll see later when we talk a little bit about what this means for Kubernetes, is if you want to take some code and actually execute it, if you're thinking about that from like a virtual machine perspective, where you have to boot up a virtual machine, put code onto it, and run it, that's order of magnitude of maybe 15, 20 minutes or something like that, depending on how slow things are. Um, then you get a container, maybe takes, I don't know, 20 seconds or something like that. And with WebAssembly, you're looking at the order of magnitude of a few milliseconds or, or even less. So you can start up hundreds of thousands of these things in the same time that you'd start up one container. So you may have, you've probably heard of WebAssembly before. You may have also heard of WASI. What the heck is WASI? WASI is the WebAssembly systems interface. So WebAssembly itself is just code. And what does code do? I, I don't know, it can heat up your CPU, but other than that, it doesn't do anything, right? It needs input output in order to actually do something useful. And WASI is the systems interface, the interfaces for doing input and output from WebAssembly. And you might be familiar with other systems interfaces, things like POSIX, that typically deal with things like files and networking. 
Wazzy is that, plus it's a bit more expansive than that. It has things for doing high-level HTTP, not built on top of network sockets. It has interfaces for dealing with key-value stores, with SQL databases, with machine learning. Um, so this is sort of kind of the next evolution of, of an interface for doing input-output that is beyond just files. And if you're really kind of listening to the whispers of, of WebAssembly, you've probably heard of WASI 0.2. What is that before? Well, this is just the latest iteration of, of WASI, so the latest iteration of the system interface that is uh, continuing to evolve. I and mean, it's built on top of something called the WebAssembly component model. What is components? Well, if you deal with raw WebAssembly, WebAssembly that we've known since 2015-ish, basically the only way to interact with that WebAssembly is by calling functions, and those functions can only take one of four types a 32-bit integer signed, a unsigned 32-bit integer, and the same for floating point numbers. And I don't know if you've ever done coding where the only thing that you can do is call functions that take numbers. It's not a lot of fun. And so typically you want to deal in higher level types, something like, I don't know, strings or lists or structs or something like that. Base WebAssembly doesn't have any of that. You have to sort of build it on top of. The component model does have all of that, so it's sort of a higher level interface for dealing with WebAssembly. It's also a standard, and these components give a standard way for WebAssembly code to be consumed and to expose their functionality to the outside world. All right, so that's WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a, a W3C standard, so this is all kind of standard stuff. Now we're moving into the world of sort of open source projects, and this, the one I want to talk about today is called Spin. Spin was started by the company that I work for, Form Fermion, but it's completely open source, um, and uh, we're moving towards an open and kind of open governance model as well. And basically what Spin is, is take writing WebAssembly apps and put a nice developer experience on top of it so that you don't have to deal with raw WebAssembly tooling, which can be... At, at the best of times, very low level, and at the worst of times, excruciating. Um, you want to put something nice on that so that you can deal with just writing kind of your business logic and not have to deal with anything more. And in particular, Spin kind of operates in sort of a, a kind of serverless or event-driven model, if you're familiar with that. So you write a Spin application to be triggered by something, let's say an HTTP request or a pub sub message or something like that. Um, and then your code executes basically based on that event. So we'll be talking a lot about serverless in this talk as a paradigm, but that's kind of where Spin is starting at. And kind of what Spin allows you to do is write your applications and you have access to a whole bunch of, of APIs that make doing things pretty easy. You have access to key value stores that you can write data into, SQLite databases, AI, kind of you can, you can do inferencing very easily without having to set up very much. And it's all kind of wrapped in a, in a CLI experience so that you're, you don't have to do too much and kind of get started really quickly. And so just real quick, since you know, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be proper if I didn't show you some code. So uh, here, for instance, is some code for a, a spin application that does, it's, it's an example code. I tried to make something that's trivial, easy to understand, but it's not hello world. And essentially what it does is you get a request and you look at the query string for the request to find a user ID in that query string. You look into a key value store, that's right here, looking into the key value store with that user ID um, and try and get some, something cached in your key value store. Um, it's supposed to be user JSON. If you get the cache hit, then you just deserialize it as JSON. And otherwise, you make some call to some downstream API to get the user as JSON here. And then you store it into your cache. And then at the very end, you return the user as, as JSON back to the response. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The key to all of this is this is everything that you write, with one exception we'll talk about in a second, for your entire app. And then Spin kind of does everything to make sure that it's compiled and running and running wherever you want it to, to run. So the only other thing that you have to write with this 
is a spin.toml, which is just a small manifest file for kind of describing some things about it. And the cool thing about spin apps is by default that they can't do anything. They are completely inert. They don't have access to anything in the outside world. They can't write to, the, to disk. They can't make any network calls. So the security story is pretty straightforward. If you don't give access to, for it to do anything, you know for a fact it doesn't do that thing. Um, so we have to actually allow it to, for instance, make a call to my.api.com, our downstream endpoint. We have to give it access to our default key value store, for instance. And I don't give it access, for instance, to make any inferencing calls to our AI model. And if I try to do that, I'll get an error and say you can't do that. So this is kind of locked down by default here. And then if you want to run it, you, you know, first you can build the app like this, spin build, and then you can do spin up, and then it runs on 3000 and you can call it. So that's how that works. So that's kind of WebAssembly and how spin fits in if you're interested. And WebAssembly is a technology that's what I work on at Fermion, the core, kind of core technology. So happy to answer questions about that as well. Happy to answer questions about Spin, which I also work on. And now we're kind of leaving the world that I work on and talking about stuff that my colleagues work on that I have less of kind of intimate knowledge with. And that is the world of, of Kubernetes and kind of running these Spin workloads in, inside of a orchestration tool like Kubernetes. So I wanna talk real quick about serverless as a, as a programming paradigm, because we already talked about how spin is kind of event driven. And if you, has everybody here heard of serverless as a paradigm, it, ABDOS Lambda or Azure Functions, anybody confused right now? No, you're lying. There's gonna be, so there's always somebody. It's fine, I'll explain it anyway. So serverless typically is you, you write kind of your business logic you, just, you kind of hand it off to something and it just runs the thing. So you don't have to deal with any of the fiddly bits of actually you know, running a web server and making sure that it's available and handling TLS certificates and blah, 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 blah. You just write your business logic and the, the platform takes care of everything else. The problem, well, first of all, that's, that's sort of what serverless is. There's some problems with serverless though. First of all, it can be really slow to start things up so there's this cold start problem in serverless where let's say you have a serverless app and it gets hit maybe you know a whole bunch at once and then 10 minutes go by and nothing happens. When, when it gets hit again, it has to sort of restart up everything, fill all the caches and all that stuff. It's typically running as containers or in some cases as actual full micro VMs and that startup can be in the order of magnitude of seconds. Sometimes it's even longer than your actual app runs. You're just spending starting the thing up. It's also almost always locked into a specific vendor. So if you want to write serverless apps, you have to go, okay, which cloud provider do I want to use? And you'll pick Amazon. And then you go, okay, you're stuck with, you know, with Lambda and you write Lambda apps. And then your boss says, okay, we're moving to Azure. And then you have to rewrite everything because everything is kind of targeted towards this proprietary serverless vendor solution. And the last thing is it's really expensive to run these things. I, I worked at Microsoft. I talked to the Azure Functions team. It's really expensive to run these things and they do a lot of work to try and make it not so expensive, but still most of that cost gets passed on to us to, to actually pay for this. And that's why in my experience, I've often not used serverless solutions because it's convenient, but it's also really costly. Um, so can we, can we solve these, these issues? Well, here's the, this, the stuff that I was just talking about. So it would be really nice if we had something that, that kind of would be able to handle some of these issues, like making sure that we're only utilizing the resources that we need, that we're downscaling when we don't you know, when we don't need these resources anymore, that we're making sure to allocate places, things in the right place, um, and, you know, that we're even taking advantage of things like um, uh, spot instances. So effectively, this is just what I'm talking about. You have something like, you know, a micro VM, like an AWS Firecracker running, you know, a bunch of workloads, more, you know, this is one machine running a whole bunch of VMs, that's cool. 
You have something like Kubernetes that can do the same thing with pods. And then what if we could get to something like this, where it's one machine running, and this is actually too few dots. It should be way more dots than that. What if we could run thousands and thousands of these workloads instead of a dozen or so? That would be really nice, wouldn't it? And that's kind of where SpinCube comes in. So we've talked about Spin as this paradigm for writing WebAssembly apps that allows you to write it in an event-driven way. SpinCube is what takes that and allows you to put it onto an orchestrator that you're probably already running, that you probably don't like running, but for some reason everybody decided we have to run these things. Um, and what SpinCube allows you to do is to run those workloads on Kubernetes and basically by default be able to get to a place where instead of one node running, I don't know, a few, maybe 10 pods or something on like that, and that's kind of taking up all the room on that node, you can run, I think the max pod number in Kubernetes is set to like 256 or something like that. That's Kubernetes limitation. We could run a lot more if we were allowed to, but Kubernetes says no, maybe that will be fixed one day. So we can take up much more room and utilize the node. And this doesn't mean that you have to have bigger machines to do this. You keep using the same machines or even downgrade to smaller machines because it's just, at the end of the day, a whole lot more efficient to be able to run this stuff. So that's really nice. And of course, you can run this anywhere that you want to run Kubernetes as well, whether that's you know, on a cloud provider or running it on a Raspberry Pi, which we've done a couple of demos of. So what does this look like in practice? We've seen business logic. Here's some JavaScript. Sorry for that. You know, your spin.toml file. Then you, you know, pass it through some kind of CLI tool, and it gives you Kubernetes kind of junk that, that runs in, in Kubernetes. That's cool. And at the end of the day, then you put it up into your cluster, and everything runs. So that's basically everything I had. Again, if you want to talk more about the core WebAssembly side of things during the panel, happy to answer questions about that. Also happy to, to talk about how this all looks when you're actually trying to run things kind of in, at large scale as well. And if you want to learn more about some of these things, here's some QR codes that you can take a picture of. So I think it was good. All right, thank you. <laughs>